Welcome, I'm Rose Martin, and we're right around the corner with John Ketwig. John is an optimistic 19-year-old, loved hot rods, music, and everything high school kids do. Soon he found himself in the NOM. And you know, John writes the fact that breakfast was the best meal of the day because he knew that he had made it another day. This fascinating guy doesn't want you to thank him for his service, and I'm gonna let him tell you why a little bit later. You know, he believes that you can be anti-war and you can also be a true patriot, one who really, really loves their country. His book introduced me to a tender vet who tried to do the right thing, who dealt with internal and external conflicts, and I found myself shedding tears for an innocent 19-year-old who was robbed of his childhood, but also for an adult his adult self still damaged by his experiences and yet finally and yearning for peace and healing. This book is still in print after 32 years and 27 printings. Join me as we meet him. Hi, John. Hi. Thank you for inviting us to your home to chat about your life and your, and your book that you've written. Really, 32 years, 27 printings. That story still resonates with people today. Well, it, it's amazing. Uh, I had never written anything more than a letter in my life. And uh, I sat down and, and typed out this story to my wife and my little, little tiny toddler kids. We thought we'd put it on the shelf. And, uh, you know, someday when they were old enough, they could look at it. And some friends said, oh, you ought to, ought to see about making that into a book, and cosmic crazy things happen, and it ended up being a book. Um, and we were told at the start, the average book sells less than 5,000, you know, enjoy it, it'll be a, a really nice experience, and then you go on with your life. And it has hung around and been uh, a factor in our life for 32 years now, so it's, it's pretty impressive. I, I can't explain it, but it's been a, a very interesting experience. Well, and it's your story, and it tells the story from your heart and your experiences. So let's go back to that January day, 1982, when that box fell off the shelf and it was time to put, this, put these stories in print. Yeah, that, the whole thing started with the uh, very famous or infamous uh, CBS documentary about General Westmoreland ordering his generals to lie about the number of Viet Cong and, and enemy soldiers that were out there aiming their guns at us. Um, I was, it was a Saturday night and I was watching television and in those days you turned the dial to right. find <laughs> another channel and I bumped into this thing right at the beginning and had no idea it was coming. And, oh my God, you know, at long last, they're telling the truth of what happened and, and what Vietnam was really like. And uh, <laughs> I, uh, my wife came down and uh, I got a big bottle of scotch and uh, went out and walked around the neighborhood and kicked rocks and, and just had this huge emotional outpouring. And uh, my poor wife said, you know, oh boy, what do we got here, you know. But that, that made me aware, geez, Vietnam is in you and it wants to come out. You got to deal with this. You can't, you can't carry this around anymore. And uh, a f couple of months later, uh, I, I, we had discovered that there were books about Vietnam. It was such a huge personal experience I couldn't imagine anybody writing a book about it and uh, when we discovered there were some went to a, a bookstore at the mall and came away with two shopping <laughs> bags full of books and sat and read them all and they were all valid there was nothing wrong with any of them but it wasn't my story it wasn't what I wanted my kids to know and everything so one Saturday afternoon, I sat down with a yellow legal pad and a pen and started scratching out notes of what I needed to make known and uh, ended up with writer's cramp. So mm. then I, we had a little manual typewriter and uh, I sat there with that. This finger types <laughs> and this one makes capitals. You know. Okay, so two and, finger uh, story. All night. Wow. Every night, I, I would work all day, 
uh, we'd get the kids in bed and everything, and uh, I'd put on the old 60s music and try to go back and, and figure out what had happened and, and how do you describe it and how do you tell your, your wife and kids, but how do you tell people what it felt like and what this was really like? And uh, gee, it became a pretty substantial pile of paper. And like I said, one thing led to another out of the blue, and it ended up becoming a book. Hmm. So each of those stories, peeling back of another layer, every time the paper, you know, you took that paper out and the pencil or the two fingers, each time a story came out, was there a little relief? Was there a little healing? Was it more raw? It was a relief to settle my thinking to a certain extent, to say, well, this is what I really feel about this and sort it out and, and uh, put words to it that if in a conversation something came up, I could say, gee, I've thought that through and here's what I want to say about that. So it mm -hmm. was very, very good from that perspective that uh, before that, it had just been something that happened back in the, the past, like kindergarten or mm -hmm. Little League or whatever, and uh, this was much more important. So it was really important to, to find a way to explain and to convey what it felt like and what it was all about. Did you find that you let the stories just emerge naturally, or did you try to go back to the beginning where that innocent 19-year-old confident guy is on that bus heading out? Did it start yeah. there, or did the stories just unwind? Um, yeah, I think it did start with, I didn't want to go. I didn't want anything to do with it. It was, uh, I'm not the guy you need. You know, I got long hair and a set of drums. I want to, I want to make rock and roll music. And, and like hot uh, rods. Yeah. yeah, you know, we... Uh, uh, my buddies, there were two with really top hot rods. We were running uh, drag racing and, and just all involved in things. Mm -hmm. And um, what do you mean you're going to take me away and cut my hair off and put me in a green suit and send me to the other side of the world? I, I'm not the guy for that, you know. Um, so, yeah, starting with that. Uh, my experience, to be honest, Rose, was um, the people I hung around with, my uh, mm -hmm. peers, did not want to go to Vietnam, did not want to be drafted, did not want to take part in this. And when I got to Vietnam, I have to say, I, my experience, 95% at least of all the people that I met over there were there against their will, did, did not want to be there, um, were very, very uncomfortable with the whole thing. And just counting the days till I can get on the plane and get the heck out of here, you know, that was, that was the emphasis. I want to survive. Mm -hmm. uh, there was not a patriotic side to it as such. It was, I'm here against my will, and uh, we'll make the best of it and try to do the right thing. You know, I, I think we had all been brought up with a basic morality, and uh, at that time, uh, I think it was a very unique time with the music that was coming out, the things that, that Bob Dylan was saying, the Beatles were saying about uh, all you need is love, and, mm -hmm. and this huge uh, change, uh, challenge to the establishment. Hey, we can make a better world than you folks have made. We got a nuclear bomb over our shoulder, you know, that uh, uh, our generation grew up with a certain amount of stress with that. And we were told in high school very plainly, your generation has to do what no other generation before you ever did. You've got to solve your problems without resorting to war because now that we have nuclear weapons, war is obsolete. It can't happen. And to go from that within a year and a half to being drafted and uh, taken into the military against your will and being on the other side of the world with people shooting at you, um, 
I felt I'd been betrayed. I felt uh, this isn't right. What's happening here is, is it's terribly frightening. But more than that, it's, it's illegal, it's immoral. I mean, all of that was being talked about openly back then. Um, we have people here trying to be free. They threw the French out, and here we come marching in. We're going to be a... Yeah, and we were another invading army, and they resisted that. And you're young, you're kids, who yeah. you're unprepared, and even, I don't know if anyone could ever be prepared, but your children, right, your 19, 20 year old kids, you're going in there, you find yourself after boot camp on the other side of the world, and your first, your very first assignment, right, they tell you to go up and now you're in the guard tower. Well, the first assignment was I got off the plane and within a night or two they sent me out to be a guard walking along the edge of the long bin ammo dump, mm -hmm. which had been blown up a couple of weeks before. Um, and, and it's like, you know, you're looking at your watch, 11 o'clock at night, geez, Johnny Carson will be on in a few minutes, mm -hmm. you know. What am I doing here? And, and, and how do I do it? There's a huge question of how in the world do I do this and get through it and survive? And, and that question kept coming up every day. Every day there was another challenge, another thing that you had to deal with. And you marked a calendar, I was reading oh, in your book. Day. You just marked a calendar, one more day, one yeah. more day, one more day, your, because you your, woke up. Your time there, uh, the Army was 365 days. The Marines did 13 months, because they're tough. Um, and yeah, you marked off every day on the calendar, made a short timer calendar, and the first thing you did in the morning was mark off another day, you know, a month gone six months gone and you got at 90 days you really started to count down and it was uh, extreme mm -hmm. um, and it was tense I've got to go back and walk down the street in America and act normal and I've got all of these things I've seen and thought and experienced in me and how in the world am I going to do that and you mentioned earlier that you constantly tried to do the right thing. So did all of these harrowing experiences, the horrific things that you saw, how did you stay above that to keep trying to do the right thing over and over and over again while you were marking your calendar, just waiting for that time that, that you would be able to come home? Well, I think a lot of that was our upbringing, that you were brought up, this is right and that's wrong. and and. I don't think you abandon that when you uh, find yourself in a, a difficult situation. Um, you did the best you could. And there were huge pressures and, and frightening, important things that you had to deal with. But somewhere deep inside, you still had that, that basic. I don't know if you want to call it morality or ethics or, or what, but you had been taught right from wrong. And to see what was happening to the Vietnamese people, I, the, the premise was we're going over there and save these people from communism, the, the, the brutality of the Viet Cong and all of that. And you got there and watched B-52s unload huge loads of bombs that shook the earth and, and completely obliterated uh, huge patches of, of Vietnam. And you, Peasants, and you, say, you wrote in your book. How, mm -hmm. Yeah, how is that better for these people? Uh, the weaponry that we use, uh, a helicopter that fires uh, a red stream of tracers, and that's only like one out of every 10 rounds or something like that. Put around in every square inch of a football field in a minute. It's huge. Mm -hmm. You can't imagine. And there's human beings under that. And you had a better idea for those B-52 bombers, that you thought they should contain what? Well, we were dealing with people that were absolutely impoverished beyond anything we'd ever imagined. Some of them were absolutely stone age. 
if we loaded those bombers with seeds and, and farm tools, you know, basic, a hoe and a shovel and a rake, mm -hmm. um, bread, basic food to feed their children and put a, a, a sign on the side that said, from your friends in America, I thought it would do a whole lot more good than dropping flaming napalm and white phosphorus and uh, you know cluster bombs and all the rest of the things and and exploding them and their world and their children and their wives. It did not win hearts and minds to hear somebody say, "Well, we're going to explode that away." and win their hearts and minds, you had to say, are you crazy? You know, mm -hmm. and, but that was the official policy. You had to conform and keep your mouth shut and do what they wanted you to do, and that was the stress of it. It was, it was a very, very difficult thing to do. And you wrote in your book that, besides that difficulty, that there was often times that you felt there was a disconnect between what was happening with some of the military brass, what was actually happening on the ground. In fact, I was, I was struck by one of your stories where you had a new CO come in and here you guys are all in the jungle and you're caked with mud and he wants you to shine up your uniforms and polish things. Yes, every morning he'd check your belt buckle and this and that to make sure that you were all shiny and polished and everything like we were back in the States. Um, and, and then you would tape it and, mm -hmm. and try to mute all of that down. Um, he hid in his bunker. He had a, a big sandbag bunker and had uh, a guy with a, a table laid out with rifles and uh, automatic weapons and everything standing at the door and he never came out. The first sergeant went in to ask him what he wanted to do and everything. He was absolutely scared to death but wanted us to be uh, polished to a stateside shine and it was like, come on. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I wrote to congressman and letters came back from Saigon. I've met him, I, I uh, had dinner with him. He's a fine gentleman and an officer and all of that. And yeah, he's gonna get us all killed, you know, so. So it's, so as we're looking at that transition then from when you're on the front lines and you're in there and now it's time that your time is coming short actually to be on the field mm -hmm. instead of coming right home you decided to take some time away i had 15 months to obligation to do in the the military before my time was up i i uh, beat the draft by enlisting which meant i had an extra year and we were hearing what was going on in America. This was uh, the summer of 1968. Uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated. Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. We had the uh, war in the streets at the Democratic National Convention. And I did not want to be assigned at home to stand on the steps of the Pentagon and hold a bayoneted rifle against the peace protesters when I was on their side. Uh, I became aware of the option that I could go to Thailand where we had military bases and everything. I could be transferred over to Thailand. It was a place where they sent guys for R&R, &R, uh, you know, rest and recreation. It was mm -hmm. a pretty entertaining place to be. And I would have the time to get my head together and figure out how I would walk down the street in Avon, New York, and, and uh, you know, be normal or, or make believe I was normal and be believable at it. Um, and I took that opportunity and I, I think it's one of the best decisions I ever made in my life. It was like, you know how a, a, a scuba diver has to rise slowly or they get the bends? Mm -hmm. This gave me the time to rise slowly and and deal with things and work it through my head and figure out what to say, how to, how to deal with all of it before 
Mm -hmm. I arrived and, and it was really abrupt. I mean, I, I've met a lot of vets who were in combat, went out on a helicopter, got on a plane and arrived back in the States and still had Vietnamese mud under their fingernails and had to make that transition immediately. I, I bought time for myself and I'm very glad I did. I think it was yeah. key. And you know, that transition, you hear a lot of different stories of what that transition was like for people who came home. Mm -hmm. And I think everyone had a different experience as you were talking about earlier. What was that like for you? It was difficult. Um, you know, the, the people make a lot of, uh, oh, the, uh, they were going through an airport and hippies spit at them and so forth. And maybe that happened occasionally, but I, I didn't really have that, and, and I think that's very out of character with the American people. I think the American people wanted their kids, their neighbors, their relatives home, um, and, and they weren't adversarial to you because you went to Vietnam. The problem was it's such a huge topic. Right. They didn't know what to say to us. We didn't know what to say to them. It was, uh, you know, if you get a job uh, and you meet at the water cooler, you, you talk about yesterday's football game or baseball game or something, not, oh boy, here's what I saw in Vietnam. That, that was just the last thing in the world you would bring up in a conversation. And you know a little bit about that too, as I talked about at the top, that you don't want people to thank you for your service or to be a veteran. How come? Well, uh, I understand when people say thank you for your service that they're trying to express something that, that's very worthwhile and uh, positive. But I was made to go against my will. I was made to see things that absolutely contradicted everything I'd ever been taught about right and wrong. Uh, it was a, a horrifying thing and a, a hugely traumatic thing. And it's not like, you know, pass the, the salt, mm -hmm. thank you. It's just so enormous. I don't want to be thanked for it. I didn't want to be there. I didn't uh, do anything heroic or anything like that. I kept my head down, survived, and got out. And a lot of other people didn't. Uh, don't thank me for the luck of the draw. When a, when a rocket comes in or a mortar comes in or there's a firefight, it is absolutely beyond your control to survive from it. You know, I, I remember laying in the mud wishing that I could make my body liquid so it would spread out and be a half an inch thick because if you were above ground, it was exposed to what was going on. Um, I was very fortunate and I didn't get wounded or uh, killed. Uh, don't well, thank really me for that. I didn't that, do that. We're really fortunate that you put these words down in writing. Would you be willing to read us a little bit of your book? Sure, sure. Um, I have to put this in context. I uh, drove convoys from time to time, drove a truck to haul supplies here or there, and uh, was, I guess, unfortunate enough to go to the Battle of Dok Tho, November of 67. It was the biggest battle of the war up to that time. Uh, battle of Hill 875, and I mean, I, I saw a lot of horrendous things uh, in a very short period of time. I volunteered to do that so that I could be exposed to fire and, and combat and all of that without my good buddies being right there alongside me, um, not knowing how I would react to the whole thing. And I did survive it. Uh, it was horrendous. And when I got back, there's a, a certain uh, compensating for all of that, and that's what this is about. Um, after the, the huge tension's over, some balloons burst, some never came home. In a single explosive moment, the air rushed out and the distended rubber membrane was relieved. 
As a straight pin relieves the balloon, so the bullet or bayonet or shrapnel must have relieved the boys in the body bags. The rest of us were released by the giant fingers to deflate at our own speed. The air rushed from the nozzle with a rasping sound, but the rocket-like propulsion took us on a ride for which we were ill-prepared. Then, lying limp on the floor, we saw ourselves. A balloon once inflated never quite returns to its original shape. The strain has been too great. Each successive inflation leaves it limp, less elastic, less resilient, and yet the balloon tries to return to normal. It wants to be normal and needs to be normal. It's the nature of a balloon to be elastic, to return to normal, but once inflated, it can never again really be normal. It feels the distension, the stretching to the limits of its thin hide, and it knows it's become more vulnerable than ever before. How many times can it be inflated before the weakened film breaks down and the explosion leaves the balloon as broken and worthless as if it had been pierced by steel? How many times? I knew in the last few days my protective covering had been stretched to the limit and weakened. How many cells, how many molecules, how many atoms still held me together? Atoms. Particles of matter so tiny, even the most gifted scientists refer to them as abstract, fragile beyond comprehension. People who endure the extraordinary stresses of life are called thick-skinned. I had survived, but without the resiliency of youth. If this was manhood, I would prefer to have remained a child. Mm. Wow, those words, that, that puts it in perspective right there. And John, I'm so sorry that we're out of time. There's so many more things I want to talk to you about. So I want our readers to make sure they pick up your book, learn about the love story with your wife right now of 47 years. That's part of this story. So I want to thank you for being on the show today and sharing your words. And I guess I would wish that you and your beautiful bride, Carolyn, can Feel the wind on your face as you talked about and ride free and find some peace and happiness in every single day. We work at it. Yeah. We try. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining me for Right Around the Corner. I hope to see you next time because we're going to be right around the corner. <laughs>